Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Women. On this show, you will learn how to create wealth through real estate the blissful way. That means with very little stress and very little time. We talk about strategies, mindset, heart set, money smarts, resources, and so much more to ensure you're able to create the success you most deeply desire. Now, here's your host, Monika Sawyer. Today, I am so excited, ladies, to welcome back to the show, Karen Hall. Yay! Oh, thank you. <laughs> sure. For, for you ladies who don't remember Karen, even though she's amazing, I'm sure you do remember her, but let me read her bio really quickly again to remind you. Despite being in the midst of a recession and mortgage market collapse, Karen Hall founded and made a resounding success of you direct IRIS services. She discovered a strategic way to put her 20 plus years in mortgage banking, real estate, and property management to use. The solution was an untapped market for both her skills and for investors, self-directed IRAs. Through you direct IRAs, she has guided tens of thousands of Americans through the process of diversifying their investments using self-directed IRAs. Hey there, Karen, welcome back. Hey, great to see you. It's been a while. It's been a while. You look gorgeous, by the way. All of you ladies who are listening, go to YouTube today. Karen looks <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Yay. So Karen, last time we talked really in depth about the self-directed IRAs. And today I'd like to give kind of like a higher level version of that conversation, just to kind of remind people sort of exactly what your company does, because there's a lot of different kinds of self-directed IRAs, right? Right. So what is it that yours specializes in? Well, with self-directed IRAs, I mean, it's the traditional, the Roth, SEP, simple, inherited IRA. Uh, We also offer the solo 401k, and that's for self-employed people who have no uh, full-time employees in any of the companies that they own. And we also offer the self-directed HSA, or health savings account. And that's a different beast altogether. So these are the accounts that we offer. But what we really, and what we do primarily during the day, like what do we do all day besides, you know, um, help people. We're customer service and we really help people a lot. We we talk to people and we'll walk them through the process. So we'll say, tell me what you're looking to invest in. What are you going to do? And then we listen to who are the people that are investing with you. We're we're screening really for prohibited transactions. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, one of the many things that we do. Got it. So define self-directed again. I know that you've done this before, but do it again. (laughs) Because people have this impression of what self-directed means, right? They do. They do. So just to understand an IRA is an IRA, right? It's it's a bucket that holds assets. So whether it has, you know, whether it's over at Charles Schwab or at some financial management company or it's self-directed, the only, the rules are the same. The only difference is the asset class that it's held inside that account. The account itself, it's the rules are all the same. But with a self-directed IRA, it, ho- it holds um, alternative assets, sometimes called non-correlated assets. There are different names for them, but basically it's like real estate and metals and notes and things like that. Got it. So ladies, I know that um, many of you have 401ks and your 401k, like if you're a W-2 employee, right? Or mm-hmm. maybe you've even got your, your, you know, your personal ones, your set by and all of that stuff for your business. And um, maybe you have what's called a self-directed 401k, right? But take a look at what that really means, because there are different kinds of self-directed. So a lot of times what a self-directed 401k or IRA means um, by normal terms is you are in an account where you can choose any of the 200 funds run by this particular company that is is the custodian of your 401k. So for instance, if you've got Fidelity or you've got Vanguard or Schwab or one of these guys, right? They do say that they're self-directed, but they're self-directed with limits. So they say you can self-direct into funds or into, you know, where are they? Like you can do a market rate, which nobody Mutual funds. But you could do mutual funds. You could do bond funds. You can do REITs, right? So there are some things that you can do, Mm -hmm. but you're limited based on the products that they offer. Okay, that's how they're defining self-directed. Karen Mm -hmm. is defining this differently. She basically says we're a custodian 
And you can take that. And again, it is within a limit. So usually you can't do collectibles or you can't do paintings, right? So there are still limits about what you can't do, but there's a much larger range of what you can do. You can do real estate. Mm -hmm. You can do um, precious metals. You could, you know, you could do a few different things. And today I think Karin's going to give us a little bit more clarity on some of those asset classes. But Mm -hmm. I just wanted wanted to define for you the difference between self-directed according to what a lot of financial institutions are calling and Mm self-directed like how Karin is defining it. Did I get that right, Karin? You did. You got it. You you understand it perfectly. Right. And so, and, and they're assets that, you know, as our name implies that you direct. So we're not choosing the asset for you. It's sort of like if you had a checking account and you wanted to invest. And so you wrote a personal check from your bank and you sent that check to the, inv- you know, to the um, investment. Um, the bank is there to facilitate your transaction. Now you direct IRA services as a third party administrator. And we use the services of a trust company custodian we've been partnered with or partnered with, but I mean, you know, working in alliance with for uh, 12 years now. And so it just, it just zips on through the, the same way. So it's administrative and not advisory. So you got it right. Got it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let's get into asset classes because this is one of those things that we haven't discussed really on this show. Mm-hmm. And I'd mm-hmm. like to get a deeper understanding myself and also for my ladies about what those asset classes are and what investing in them kind of looks like. Right. I think the number one asset class really is real estate, you know, and, and when I started Udirect IRA services in 2009, it was in the middle of a recession. And you maybe recall, you probably still are holding on to some of these assets or maybe you just sold them all. I don't know. But where you could buy houses on tape. Remember those days? I do. And so in 2009, um, self-directed IRAs really exploded in the real estate investor market because real estate investors didn't have access to capital. Uh, Banks weren't lending, right? So when it comes to real estate as an asset class, self-directed IRAs really um, became more to the forefront at that time. So again, it was, you could buy foreclosures, you could, and everyone was a flipper. I mean, and you know, it seems like, and now you, I ask people when I'm out speaking, who's a flipper? Not, not so many people now, they're different. You always have to, you know, sniff and scurry. Remember that, who moved my cheese? Yeah. You, when you're in real estate, man, you have to be able to move with your cheese. So, but that's how it was then. And so real estate could be brick and mortar. Real estate can even be uh, private placements, which are like syndications. So perhaps, um, you know, maybe you know someone who's trying to raise capital to build a very large apartment complex, for example, and they don't have all the capital themselves. They, they have some, they get some uh, maybe financing, and then they also use self-directed IRAs as part of that whole package to, you know, to close on that deal. So a self-directed IRA can be an equity partner in a deal like that into a private placement, also called a syndication, uh, sometimes crowdfunding. It's kind of the same name for the same thing, uh, private stock. So that's another way where it's still correlated to real estate, but it's just a different like vehicle. You know, usually it's when people invest, it's debt or equity. That's usually what it is, debt or equity. So when you're investing, either you're loaning money or you're becoming an equity member or shareholder of that situation. Okay. So real estate, uh, that's, you know, uh, you can get in this in into other um, real estate assets like, like raw land. Now you have there the caveats about raw land. You have to make sure that you own the whole parcel because if you own part of a parcel and there's one tax id and but two people own that parcel the usually the tax collectors won't take that tax check unless it's unless you have you know the whole tax amount in the same envelope so you know little nuances about every single asset class so again real estate can be you know straight up brick and mortar can be private placements raw land Oh, what can, I mean, you know, multifamily, uh, anything, anything that is real estate related. And then that goes on to the next topic, which is still real estate related. And that's notes. Yes. You know, you, you know you yes, I do. And you've heard of it. I've <laughs> heard of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy performing and non-performing debt. People do it all the time. Your IRA can also be the bank and lend money to people in situations. Maybe they need a, maybe, um, they know someone who needs a bridge loan because they're moving and they haven't sold their house yet, you know, so your IRA can lend money to people. So it can be secured and unsecured debt that an IRA, you know, can lend. Um, so it's, so it can be the bank and lend money and then it can also buy and be the investor and make, um, you know, a secured, a buy a secured and unsecured notes uh, and get them reperforming or enjoy that continued performance. 
Um, and then of course there's a precious metals field. A lot of people love precious metals. They just love that. It's that tangible, touchable asset. When it's in a self-directed IRA though, you're not gonna hold on to it. It's going to be custody for you at a, uh, well, we, we custody the assets at Delaware Depository and they uh, will hold the, the actual metal for us and for your account. And so that you have the metal, the coins. So say for example, you say, well, I want all those coins, I wanna hold them. So you would basically take a distribution, a taxable distribution, and we would send the coins to you if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, or the, otherwise it can stay there in your account being held and hopefully growing in value because you know obviously that's the game. We wanna win that game. Right. right, got it. Yep, 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 we do. Some of the asset, oh, sorry, some of the asset classes there. Yeah, so someone said to me something interesting and Karen, I've never had an opportunity to have this conversation and I know I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. Okay. But I also know you're up to it. So, <laughs> so I was talking to another investor and he said, mm -hmm. I would never invest my 401k tax deferred money into another tax deferred asset like real estate, because then you lose the benefit on one side or the other. So what do you yes. have to say to that? I say your friend is right. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's true. So but here, here's why you do want to use a self-directed IRA. So if you have a whole pile of cash, you know, or, or whatever, a great credit score, you're going to you're going to do this personally with real estate, say brick and mortar real estate. Yes, you get incredible write-offs. You get really great tax deals. Um, so if you've got the money in your IRA and the money personally, oh, what, what to do? I have found this great piece of property I want, to, I want to take down. Which one should I use? Then you talk to your tax person and you probably will come to the conclusion very likely that, hey, maybe, the, uh, maybe doing it personally is going to give me more tax benefit. That's entirely possible. But like with any investment... You do, you, you get it down on paper. You know, you look at your deal from beginning to end, acquisition costs, holding costs, you know, um, liquidation costs. And what, what are you going to net at the end? You really always want to write it down on paper. But there could be a different question. And this is when the self-directed IRA comes in. Maybe you don't have a lot of cash on hand. You know, maybe really the bulk of your assets is your 401k from where you used to work, for example. You roll that money, that tax deferred money into a self-directed IRA, that IRA acquires the property. And now all the proceeds from that asset, like rent or proceeds from a sale are tax deferred. And they can be tax-free in a Roth as well. So yeah, so it, it, you can really um, maximize that, um, that benefit. And you're not gonna get write-offs. All expenses of real estate have to be paid for by the IRA. All uh, you know, all the expenses of any IRA owned asset have to be paid for by the IRA, right? And similarly, all, all um, proceeds have to go back into the IRA. Um, but there you go, you know, so that, that's, a, that's one way to look at it. An IRA can be the way to go with real estate for that reason, because you've got the money, where are you going to put it? In the stock market or in, you know, Wall Street, Wall Street or Main Street, right? Right, got and it. And so that, that's when it makes sense. Okay. So it's more like when you have, that's where you have the assets, then that's yes, where you can exactly. invest it. Got it. Yeah, that's it's a long way, but yeah. Yeah. You it up perfectly, yeah. Got it. <laughs> so, and then the other question is normally with real estate, when we do it privately, mm -hmm. we um, leverage. So, right. We might put 20% down and then we get right. a loan on the rest of oh. it. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that equivalent in a possible, you know, doing it in your um, retirement account. Right. And what you bring up is really our number one most misunderstood thing about a self-directed IRA is debt. And I'm really glad you brought this up because it, it'll. It, I love to provide some clarity. It, there's a lot of confusion. Okay. So here's the thing. I come from the mortgage world, the residential mortgage world. I spent a lot of time there. So when I found out that a bank or an institution will make a loan to an IRA account and not an individual, I was completely surprised. So that's how it works. When your IRA is acquiring a real estate, you know, piece of real estate, and you need leverage to do it because you don't have a hundred percent. You can't go take a loan from a bank. You, your IRA cannot go get a Fannie Freddie conventional conforming FABHA loan. It's just, and the reason is because there's no recourse against the IRA. All right. But your IRA can borrow money. It still can borrow money like a commercial loan called a non-recourse loan. So the IRA, I, and if you, if anybody who's listening wants a copy 
of my list of non-recourse lenders. It's not a list that we necessarily recommend, but it's just hard to find everybody. So we put them on one piece of paper. So I'll share it. Um, just email me info at udirectira.com if you want that. But your IRA takes on this debt. So what are the parameters and what does it look like? Well, you can ask the lenders and they'll tell you their underwriting guidelines, but usually they want the IRA to have a little more skin in the game when they're doing this. Um, and so that's great. So say, for example, your IRA finds a house that's $100,000, just for math, and mm -hmm. your IRA has 70, and your IRA, then you borrow another 30, so you have enough. Now, one of the things you want to think about here, because you're acquiring real estate, is do you have a pad for expenses? So that's if you've exactly got that what I was going to say. Yeah. If you've got that property, keep a 10% pad for things like property taxes, you know, the water heater broke or something. You're, gonna, you're always going to have expense, we know, with real estate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always. So have a pad for expenses, but say, for example, you take 70,000 of your IRA money, 30,000 of this non-recourse debt, and you buy the house. Yay. So 70% is IRA money, 30% is debt. Great. Now here comes your rent check. Say it's $1,000. $700 your IRA earned because of saving, and $300 your IRA earned because of leverage, because you borrowed money. Okay. So that $300 that your IRA received because of leverage is taxable to the IRA. The IRA can sometimes pay tax. And this is called UDFI, Unrelated Debt Financed Income Tax. Um, you can read about it at irs.gov publication 598. So 598. Mm -hmm. And your IRA would file, uh, like you and I, we do a 1040 when we do our taxes, mm -hmm. our personal taxes. An IRA files a 990T, okay? So the IRA files a 990T, your tax person helps figure out for you if you could take deductions or whatever, and then your IRA would pay any tax if any is due. So that is how that works. So that's really interesting. So my impression, so when you look at that, like, okay, so 70% was paid because you put 70% in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to go on for however long you hold the property. So whatever. And then, but the debt piece, if you make a profit or if you bring in money for that debt piece, you get taxed on it. Mm -hmm. That's confusing to me. Why are you getting taxed in your IRA? Because my thought was that oh, we would be right. like, the whole point is to be able to make profits on this, like, and have it grow, right? That's why you have it in an IRA. That's right. And you can, and sometimes you have so many expenses that there is no tax. But you still have to take a look at it and see if there is. Mm -hmm. But it's it's called unrelated debt financed income tax. So the debt is not related to the savings. I think about when you've got an IRA, you've got a cap on how much you can put in there. Mm -hmm. So just getting borrowing a whole bunch of money isn't like a contribution. You see, so so the tax protected money is what you saved with your contribution caps. The debt is something it's unrelated. Got it's, it. It's, you see, it's unrelated. And a, a, the way I heard it explained originally, it's, it kind of goes back to, for example, the, the uh, Catholic Church. Like so many things go back, you know, to the church. So say, for example, the Catholic Church, which is a tax-exempt entity, and this is, I think, some case law going back a while ago. Let's say that they have a bakery. And, you know, it's part of their, you know, on their land or whatever, and they're tax-exempt. And so they're selling baked goods. Well, then somebody opens a bakery across the street or whatever, for the sake of example, well, now they have to pay all kinds of taxes and the church being a tax exempt entity isn't going to pay as much. So it's not, you know, there's, it's not fair in, mm -hmm. in that sense. And it, it's, it's not fair competition. Well, I think that's about, I think that's the origination of these taxes. It, it, it goes, it's not just IRAs, but it's tax exempt entities. I believe that nonprofit organizations file 90, 90Ts as well. And, you know, so, so it's, it's a way to create parity between the different uh, kinds of, of entities that are doing the same thing. I think that that's how it originated, but it is still due. So it, it, th those are a couple of reasons why it exists. Got it. So that's really, really interesting. And I've never heard of that before. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yes, definitely ladies, if you want to get that list of the non-recourse lenders, mm -hmm. um, it's at info at you direct ira.com. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to have, that'll be in the notes and car and I'll talk about it again later. But um, so that's how to get that is how, how big is that list? I heard there were only four lenders that do. No, that. no, not, no, there are more than four. Okay. We probably have a dozen. So okay. there, I mean, there may be four big ones. Um, I can think of one really big one in particular that's 
national. I mean, they're not all national. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a list of several different lenders and you can see what region, you know, what region you're in, what region they're in and what makes the most sense for you. Got it. Now, now, so one of the things you talked about is that you want to make sure that you have a buffer for maintenance, right? Or for taxes or insurance or, you know, there's bills that come up, right? Um, yeah. Each year. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of buffer in your account. So let's say, you know, you're investing that $70,000. Well, you should have a hundred thousand, you know, well, that's what I would do. Cause I'm super conservative. I know others will do other, other things, <laughs> but like I would put, I keep a pretty nice, I keep a nice buffer. So, but what happens if the expenses exceed that buffer and you have to now pay expenses from yeah. outside of the IRA, what happens? Right. Well, there are resolutions. There are ways to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first plan of attack may be to write a check and make a contribution to your IRA uh, or your 401k, which you can do if you have earned income. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you have earned income, and again, it depends upon your age, your account type, and your income, how much you can contribute. But that's probably the first line is to just write a check out of your personal account, contribute it to your IRA, have your IRA pay the bill. You know, maybe it's tax or whatever, repairs mm -hmm. or something. The second level may be to say that, uh, you you know, you probably have a portfolio with assets in different places. A lot of people like to be diversified. So maybe sell some of the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds that you have at another, you know, another institution, liquidate them and move them over to the self-directed IRA and use that capital to make mm. up the shortfall. Okay. Uh, you could also, your IRA could also take on debt as, in a non-recourse you know, fashion um, from somebody who's, you know, we talked before about qualified and disqualified people. So just real quick, disqualified people, your lineal ascendants and descendants, you, you, know, you and your spouse, your parents and grandparents, children and grandchildren disallowed to the IRA, plus a 50-50 business partner, and any fiduciary to the plan disallowed. So those people couldn't lend to your IRA, but other people could, like your next door neighbor, your cousin, they could go ahead and lend to your IRA. So that's how you would make up a shortfall. Now, if all else fails, you'd have to sell the asset. If, and you know, sometimes we, we come into assets, especially real estate with expenses, uh, you've got a sewer or something is a really big issue and you have to liquidate. So that is another option as well. Okay, interesting. All right. So there's that. And then the next piece is, all right, so now let's say I'm 59 and a half or whatever it is. Right. And now I've got this piece of property that's not liquid. Right. Yeah, right. Um, what do we do? Because now we've got to start, you know, according to law, we've got to start taking money out. Right. So talk Ooh, to me yeah, about that. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. You know, good news. So 59 and a half is actually a good age because when you turn 59 and a half there and thereafter, you can take money out of your pre-tax IRAs, you know, the kind where you've got a tax deduction, you know, like the, the traditional, the SEP, the simple IRA, the 401k, pre-tax 401k, without a penalty. So that's the 59 and a half buffer, you know, right there. So now you can take your money out penalty-free, still taxing, still being taxed. Now, I think what you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, is when you're, when you reach, it used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72, Yes. And yes. And after this year, it could be 75. We might see that. And uh, when Congress meets at the end of the year and they discuss all these changes they have proposed to the retirement system, uh, most of which are awesome. So it could be 75, but it's called the RMDH, Required Minimum Distribution. Yes. And um, we have articles about this on the UDirect website. If you'd like to um, read about them, you can just go to our search bar, type, type RMD and their articles. But when you reach right now at 72 and a half, then you begin to take your RMD. So you take your age and it, it's, and then you go on the IRS's website, they have a table. So you multiply, you know, your savings times this, times this factor. And that's the minimum you have to draw. Um, so a couple of things, I was just actually researching RMDs today. And if you don't take your RMD today, there is a 50% penalty for not taking it. So in other words, a 50% of what your RMD should have been will be the penalty. That's oh, how it is today. Yeah. yeah. So with the new laws that are looking to come out at the end of 2021, they may rescind that penalty altogether. I've heard of that. They may reduce that penalty to 25%. I've heard that. So that's what might happen. Um, but what is true today is that if there's some really good reason why you didn't take your RMD, maybe you're hospitalized or maybe, I don't know, you know, something that was beyond you, you some act of God or something, 
um, then you can tell the IRS they didn't used to they didn't used to have this kind of leniency, but you can tell the IRS and there is a method to communicate with them like, hey, I didn't take my RMD and here's a really good reason why. And then you get a get out of jail free card. So those are some really good things to know about these required minimum distributions because the IRA gives you a tax break up front for making your contributions, but later on you have to pay the piper, um, usually when you're older and, and uh, there you go. That's how it works. Well, okay. So that's how it works, right? And that makes a lot of sense when you have liquid assets, but you've got this big property in there. It's not <laughs> liquid. So yeah. now how do you take those distributions, right? Right. Oh, good question. I mean, in, so if you wanted to talk to, like in theory, um, you could get a valuation every year and disperse a fraction, you know, like a percentage of the asset to yourself every year but that just isn't practical. The reason is because your IRA has to pay for that annual valuation. And evaluation is probably about $600 if it's an appraisal. And it just ends up not being cost-effective to do that every year. So typically when people are reaching that R&D age, they will either um, like liquidate the property, just sell it. Or what you can also do is you can disperse the entire house to yourself as an asset. And then you'll get 1099 on, on the value of that asset. So you provide a valuation, you complete a non-cash withdrawal, which we will help you with. And then the title and the ownership of that property will can be um, reverted to you as, as a person. And then your 1099 for the value of the transfer. So that's two ways, liquidate or take it as an asset, but either way it involves tax. So it's, it's a good idea to have that plan ahead of time. So the other, the other plan is to have so many other IRA accounts um, or money in different IRAs where you've got a lot of cash and liquidity that you have enough liquid assets to in, in your retirement, qualified funds in your retirement account to take those R&Ds and retain the property. That's another way to go. Got it. So um, three different ideas. Okay. There. When you sell it or liquidate it within the, within the IRA, you, you don't have to go through the whole 1031 song and dance, correct? No. No, because they're different universes. You know, the qualified funds are this little universe over here. Mm -hmm. Quali you know, 1031 is over here. They're different bubbles. So no, you don't 1031. You don't 1031. And, and you don't pay your capital gains on that. You don't have the Correct. recapture of depreciation. So you don't have all of those yes. pieces. Is that true? It is true. I mean, and you can also ask your tax advisor since we technically don't give tax advice. But right. it is true ever had to recapture depreciation, you, you know, that's, that's not fun. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so that's a reason to invest in a tax, uh, you know, a tax deferred asset in a 401k, right? Because then you don't, right. you can kind of get out of it without having to pay all of those capital gains that you would normally, normally we're like 1031, 1031, like how do we get from paying all of these taxes? Right. So. And by the way, um, on October 30th, I'll be doing a brunch. Um, with the Norris Group and with a 1031 exchange accommodator. But we'll talk about the times and the technicalities of sometimes when the IRA and 1031 can merge. So um, just, you know, tune into our, uh, if you want, if you want, go to our website and sign up for our newsletter and then you'll get an email. Uh, we send out weekly emails talking about the events we participate in. And we'll send you an email telling you about that event uh, coming up October 30th, 2021. Yeah. So that yeah. is a perfect segue. Why don't you tell everybody how they can find out more information? Oh, great. Well, you know, we're all over social media. So if you want to network with other self-directed IRA people, do it there. It's great. You know, all the classics, you know, Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and all these different uh, social media outlets. So you can find us there. But basically at our website, udirectira.com, we have just years and years of blog articles that can really provide some clarity to your self-directed IRA investing questions. Uh, we've got um, links to the, um, the IRS and where they go deep on different uh, issues and so that you can learn more uh, that way. And also you can find our contact information, just pick up the phone and call us and talk to us and tell us what your questions are. We'll, we'll work with you. Perfect. Yeah. I love that. And then, and the uh, web, sorry, the email address again was info at udirectira.com, correct? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. And you can, ladies, you can get that list of um, non-disclosure lenders from there also. 
Mm-hmm. So perfect. All righty. Awesome. Well, thank you, Karen. Are you ready for our three rapid fire questions? I don't know. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So Karen, give us a super tip on getting started investing in real estate. Oh my gosh. Do your due diligence and talk to everybody and ask them and get advice. If you're getting started, you can do it for free. People will give you free advice. Real estate investors are the nicest people I ever met for the most part. They just want to help you. They just want to help you. So listen to people, do your due diligence before you invest, do all your homework. That's my advice. I love that. And then what is one strategy on being successful in real estate investing? Stay on top of it because it's a, it's a moving target. Um, Mm -hmm. There are so many different moving pieces when it comes to real estate, uh, like your, 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 not your value, your tenants, um, you know, not that I'm a, you know, I don't advise about real estate investing, but what I see, and when it's in a self-directed IRA, what you really want to do is stay on top of it by looking at your self-directed IRA account. Make sure that you see that monthly, you know, check going in every month, that rent, if you've got a rental property, or if you your IRA has lent money, is that no repayment coming back in every month? Go into your account. We give you a PDF. You can download a PDF of your monthly statement every month. Save it in your files because we don't keep them forever. So, you know, save all that and be good about your bookkeeping. That would be great. Got it. And then Karen, what is one daily practice that you do that you would say contributes to your personal success? Oh, well, two things. One thing I don't do every day, but most days is I exercise. Mm -hmm. Uh, I go to the gym (laughs) and that's just, that's just energy and vitality. You got to get the blood moving and your body kind of likes it when blood circulates. I know Mm -hmm. mine does. It keeps me awake. So that's great. And also just, you know, meditation and prayer is really good to put myself in a thoughtful space before I start my day and to start my day with intention. Um, is really helpful. I love that. Thank you. This has been so informative. I've never gotten to ask those particular questions about self-directed IRA. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah, you bet. Yay. And ladies, thank you for joining Karen and I for this portion of the show. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, remember, goals without action are just dreams. So get out there take action, and create the life your heart deeply desires. I'll see you soon. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to find out more about how to become a blissful millionaire, go to blissfulinvestor.com. See you next time.